How's everyone doing? Um, I recognize some names and then I recognize names that I don't know. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stone. I'm the executive director of the Flagstaff Arts Council. Uh, Chris Casola is um, also on the call here. She's our grants um, person at the Arts Council. She um, keeps everybody um, in check and make sure that things are done on time and um, people get their paperwork and all that jazz. Um, so this is a re overview of a new program that we have never offered before. Uh, and so thus the information session to try and explain uh, the differences between its format as well as uh, the purpose that we're trying to achieve uh, with uh, the grant program. And so uh, I want to get to as many questions and be able to answer as many questions as possible. So. But before I do that, for, because I don't recognize all the names, um, if everyone can just um, introduce themselves uh, for the benefit of the group as well. Um, and there's somebody who dialed in on the phone with the 602 number. Are they able to? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Lane Seaton. Mm -hmm. If you could just introduce yourself. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. I am the Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at Arizona Science Center in Phoenix. And um, we've worked with several of the schools and libraries up in Flagstaff and the surrounding areas. So um, we were really glad to see this opportunity and glad to be on the call to just learn a little bit more about it. Great. Thank you. Um, Katie Blazek or Blazek? It's Blazek, yeah. Hi, I'm Katie, and um, I am the secretary of the board for the Northern Arizona Celtic Heritage Society. And I am new to grants. Um, this is my first like season of them, so I'm just here to absorb and learn. Great, thank you. Um, Chris? Uh, I'm Paul Moore. I'm the city's best architect. Oh, no, wait, sorry. I introduced myself. I I'm Chris. I'm the executive director at Theatricos. Okay, then uh, Deanna or Dina? Hi, I'm Deanna. I am the Director of Operations for the Boys and Girls Club of Flagstaff. And I also sit on the board. I'm the treasurer for Threaded Together here in town. Great, thank you. Um, Eric R. Oh, sorry, I just got on moments ago. What are we doing? <laughs> uh, introductions. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm Eric Redderbush. Um, I'm an uh, alternative process photographer in town. Um, I do tintype photography and um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, James J. Hello, my name is James Jay. I was uh, with the Northern Arizona Book Festival for a long time and actually the proposal I'm thinking of, um, I might want to get with uh, Katie to talk about a little bit more because I think it might have to do uh, more along the lines with the Northern Arizona uh, Celtic Heritage Society as well. So. Cool. Um, and your names keep bouncing around on my list, so I'm trying to catch all of you. Sarah Haas? Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Haas. I'm a movement artist and I also build tiny mobile houses that transform into stages. So I'm um, particularly interested in how uh, to bring performance art to people. Just in general, I have been, so yeah. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here, Jody Laura. Hi, I'm Jody Laura, and I'm here representing Master Corral as their business manager and Flagstaff Community Band as the chair of the board. And Lane Seaton, did I, I don't know if I think I got you. Yep, you did. Um, Lindsay, do you, do you, sorry, uh, Lindsay, do you just, wow, I'm having a hard time, Lindsay. <laughs> You're muted. How about that? Sorry, guys. Lindsay D. Stefano, uh, owner of uh, AAZ Photo, AAZ Custom. We are a full printing and custom framing shop here in Flagstaff. 
Um, I have a program called Shared Spaces that sponsors artists and brings them together with businesses in wall space. Great, thank you. Um, Paul? Hello, I'm Paul Moore. Thank you, Chris, for the uh, introduction earlier. Um, but in this case, I'm here on behalf of Human Nature Dance Theater. And then uh, Saza Kent. Hi, I'm Saza. I'm the um, co-founder and artistic director of Epic Dance Company. We're actually based in Phoenix. Um, so I'm not sure if this, are we allowed to apply for this? <laughs> Can you tell me that? Depends on what you have in mind and who your collaborators are. And, okay. um, you know, if it meets the uh, intent of the program in terms of uh, enhancing the Flagstaff um, creative sector. Great. Um, so uh, we are a, we combine street dance and uh, and concert dance with hip hop theater to tell stories and spread a message. And we do a lot of work in schools with school residencies and things like of that nature. And that's kind of the direction I was thinking of going with this if it applies. So that's why I'm here is to find out if my idea works. Sure. And then Susan Walter, you're muted. Hey guys, I'm Susan Walter, GM down at the Orpheum Theater. Thanks for having us. Great. Um, so I, this is probably about all we'll be expecting. I do know there's some other people that are interested in the program as well and I've heard some ideas being bounced around on the fringe um, in terms of offhand conversations. So hopefully we'll be able to get this uh, recording out uh, and so people can learn more about the program. And then in the spirit of collaboration, I hope that all of you could certainly, um, you know, share uh, the information of this program because, um, especially because of our process, uh, since it isn't a heavy lift on the initial application, uh, we really want um, to hear as many ideas as possible. Then what we'll do is, uh, I'll describe the process, but we'll invite um, people to apply with a more detailed application. So um, this is, this is, really designed to be, um, you know, vetting of, of ideas, initial vetting of ideas, and then um, hopefully whittle that down to a few select projects that are selected uh, to be funded. So um, the, as you can get by the name, I'm having a hard time talking today, I'm sorry. As you, you get by the name, it's about collaboration, it's about recovery, and it has something to do with COVID. So COVID causes, caused us to need to recover from something and we want to accomplish it in a collaborative way. Um, and the Arts Council values collaboration in general, uh, but we feel that we'll get sort of more mileage out of um, the, the dollar investment as well as um, we believe that collaboration is a great way to strengthen um, and, and create sort of resilient um, relationships uh, that I think will, will pay dividends um, even not in um, a recovery time period, but in general. So what, what better time to try it than uh, during um, a recovery? So um, we'll talk about the grant itself. So what is it and who can apply? Um, and then we'll talk about the, the letter of intent process, the grant platform, as well as um, the, the ongoing, sort of the further application process uh, beyond the letter of intent. And then we'll be able to kind of bounce ideas um, off. So uh, if, if at some point, you guys will have questions. Well, I'm thinking about this. Does it apply? Does it not apply? Um, I can answer those throughout, um, or we can answer those at the end and have kind of just a general conversation. Um, so the Flagstaff Arts Councils, I know there's some new names in here. Uh, we are the city's arts, science, and culture agency, um, but we are in an independent nonprofit organization. We also um, manage the Coconino Center for the Arts. You're probably familiar with the um, First Friday Art Walk, uh, which hopefully will be coming back in October. And uh, we do the Viola Awards amongst other things. So, um, but in this case, our primary function, um, as, as far as you guys are concerned, um, is our administration of the BBB Art and Science Pass-Through Grant Program. So the BBB um, is the, the City of Flagstaff Dead Board and Booze. Um, uh, tax program of which there is a, a very specific allocation that is set by statute 
that goes to the various funds within the uh, BBB program. So uh, one of those is beautification. The other one is art, and, uh, sorry, art and science. Uh, then there's other funds um, as well. Um, and those are not um, set by council. So those are set by, um, by voter approval. So uh, depending on how much money comes in in a year to the art and science fund, then the city allocates a percentage of that to uh, the Arts Council, as well as the um, pass-through grant program. And then the rest of those art and science funds um, go to some sort of internal city administration, as well as the, um, the public art program uh, here at Flagstaff. So they administer that as a, as a city function. Um, so if you don't know the Arts Council, this um, may not seem new to you, but we recently announced a new mission statement for the organization as to foster creative opportunity. Um, and there's a lot of meaning packed into those two words, creativity and opportunity. Um, and one of those is sort of the intentional step back from the word art in that mission statement. And part of that is because uh, we are the art, science and culture agency, but we see kind of the creative process is something that applies to art. It also applies to science and discovery. And, um, and that by working and creating together, we create sort of a, a more a strengthened culture um, in our community. So art, science, and culture sort of addressed there. The idea of opportunity is really around um, does, uh, just, does our creative community itself have opportunity in Flagstaff? So is Flagstaff supportive of, of the arts, of creative professionals? And then opportunity is, goes the reverse direction. Do the people of Flagstaff or the visitors of Flagstaff have access to and are they enriched by um, the work of the creative sector. So, like I said, a lot packed into two words, uh, and but that's what's driving our new mission as an organization. Um, so our vision uh, is similar to what it was before, um, but we added a couple words to it. Um, so uh, Flagstaff is a vibrant creative community at the intersection of art and science. Um, so we're positioning Flagstaff as kind of this, this um, unique place where we value art and science, we're a STEM city, um, we want to see kind of those more uh, creative collisions between um, our science community and our arts community. And so that's where the vision came from uh, for that. All of this is the result of many, uh, many months of outreach and um, surveys and roundtables. And uh, we believe that this uh, encapsulates a lot of that feedback that we've received from the community and will help us uh, be better um, leaders and catalysts uh, to support the work that you guys do. Uh, the Art and Science Fund itself has some very specific goals. Um, so in some of this is kind of set by, um, you know, sort of government money, right? Um, you have to accomplish certain things when you're using tax funded resources. Um, but we want to enhance the quality of life uh, for Flagstaff residents uh, to provide financial support through the distribution of city funds to nonprofit organizations. Uh, we want to assist organizations in developing excellence in nonprofit organizational management. Some of this applies to like the GOS and other project programs, um, but it still should kind of flow through uh, this program as well. Uh, we want to stimulate public and private support for and a sense of community among our nonprofit organizations. Uh, we want to increase opportunities uh, for community-based experiences and then to support the development of new and emerging um, uh, organizations dedicated to um, artistic, scientific, and cultural achievement. Um, so the Arts Council, uh, like I said, we announced our new mission statement at the Viola Awards uh, this year, which if we had held that event just a week later, it would have been canceled. Um, so nevertheless, um, a lot of our work has been focused on um, uh, two things. One is how do we keep, keep the Arts Council alive? Um, all of us as nonprofits uh, and or you know anybody really um, has been been fighting, fighting real hard uh, to keep um, to keep their organizations and livelihoods and everything um, sustained. And that's the true for us as an organization as well. Uh, and but at the same time, how can we split our attention to focus on supporting our creative sector through that? Um, and so what, some of the things that we did were we made existing fiscal year 20 project grants um, unrestricted or we provided extensions depending on the organization's circumstance. Uh, so uh, P 
people did not really have to prove to us that they accomplished everything they said they were going to accomplish uh, because it, that, that would have been an unfortunate thing for us to go start yanking money back from people because they couldn't fulfill their obligation. And that's not really in the spirit of, of how do we, you know, strengthen ourselves together uh, and sort of batten down the hatches and come and come through uh, to the other side. Um, the, we fundraised uh, $20,000. Uh, so this, I believe this is the first time, and Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we've actually uh, fundraised uh, for the Art and Science Fund. Um, so $20,000 isn't a lot, uh, but we were able to secure another $87,000 um, from the city's BBB program. So basically what they did is they reallocated um, some money from a future or a low priority capital uh, public art projects is how I understand that happens. So they're like, we have this thing we're holding money for. Do we really need to hold money for it? Um, so can we just kind of repurpose its use in the art and science fund? So still within the art and science funds um, purpose, uh, but something that can be a little bit more um, catalytic and supportive of our nonprofits at this time. Uh, so we awarded $87,000 to 23 nonprofits over, over April and June. Um, and then we had $20,000 left over. And so what we did was we set that aside for this grant program. Then we awarded $340,000 uh, through the Art and Science Fund allocations to our GOS regular, regular GOS and project programs. Um, and there we set aside $20,000 from the 360, knowing that we were anticipating doing this project. So essentially, rather than awarding $55,000 in project grant programs, um, that we awarded 35,000 um, because when we initially did the call for projects, uh, we hadn't um, put together sort of specific criteria or kind of really fully understood how we can maybe use those resources in um, uh, ways that, uh, you know, are specifically targeted at, at COVID response. So we had grants focused on nonprofits, specifically for the nonprofit to weather the storm. And then we have project grants, which are designed to accomplish a specific task or outcome. And so by merging those together, uh, we created this grant program. And so in addition to that, we're trying to stay on top of our communications and resources. Um, uh, at the beginning, nobody really knew what was going on. So we were trying to be kind of a, a resource for that. It seems like a lot of our organizations have finally started to kind of understand what's happening uh, in the community and, and getting a better grasp on what reopening looks like. And um, so uh, we're happy to kind of be a resource up front um, and, and to continue to be a resource. Um, but I feel, I feel like um, everybody is, uh, I hate to, uh, a new normal is not the right word, but um, that we're starting to understand, um, uh, you know, the situation that's in front of us because we've been living it for six months. Um, so we released a marketing RFP today, um, and I'm only sharing that with you because we, we believe that that marketing uh, project is going to be um, important for the, the future. Like, so how do we kind of put fuel behind awareness of the creative sector in Flagstaff? Um, this, this scope, uh, which is and initially is a $40,000 scope um, from a different funding source, so it's not from uh, from the grant pool, but uh, that we uh, want to kind of start energizing um, the sector as a brand itself. And so that's what that um, RFP is about. And if you're interested in learning more about that, it's on our website under the news section. Um, but we're trying to get the word out. We don't know everybody in town. So if you know people that um, are fantastic branders or um, fantastic website designers um, that you think would do justice, uh, for the creative sector, um, please share that link with them. And then uh, we're supporting catalytic projects such as um, a proposed Arts and Ideas Festival, uh, which uh, Chris uh, Verrill, who's on the call, um, was the, is the champion for, and has gotten, that, um, gotten a bunch of people around over the last year plus. Um, so what is the uh, COVID collaboration grant. Well, first of all, we have $40,000 available. The funding period begins December 1st uh, and goes to November 30th. Although, you know, that's just, the end date is just kind of a flexible thing, um, but we pegged a year for it. Um, and then, you know, because we want, want projects to happen uh, and, um, and happen as quickly as possible or, or 
so that they can start to have um, support for the sector or, or to, to pay um, to be catalytic uh, for the sector as it starts to recover. Um, so the grant provides flexible funds to support a project that addresses common needs or opportunities presented by the coronavirus pandemic and economic recession. I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, we may award projects, so we're, we're pegging the award value between five and $10,000, and we're not requiring a cash match. Um, however, eight times 10 is 80,000, that's more than, than what we have available. Uh, but, uh, so we're thinking grants in the range of five to $10,000, um, might be less, might be more, but that seems like a sweet spot for us right now to be able to, um, you know, provide a, a fairly substantive uh, project grant. Um, we could go higher for the right project, um, but those are kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, things where you may want to talk to staff before you submit the letter of support if you're thinking about something like that. Um, so all projects will receive some level of technical support from the Flagstaff Arts Council. So we're also looking to see how the Arts Council can help the project uh, and provide in-kind value for the project to some extent. It, it could be any number of things. One, it could be marketing support. Um, it could be um, grant writing support. So saying, hey, uh, we want to do this, but we don't quite know how to go about funding it. Um, you know, maybe we can provide um, guidance and support in that direction. In the past, I mean, for our projects, we're usually just like, wonderful idea, you proved that you have the, the capability to do the project completely based upon the team that's presented. Um, and, and then we check in on occasion. This time around, because it matters so much to the creative sector, we wanna be able to step in and help where we have the capacity to and where it makes sense. Um, but nevertheless, hopefully the project team or the, the collaborators have a decent amount of the skill and the, um, to, to pull it off and that that'll come into the evaluation of that. But if there's something the Arts Council can do um, to help a project be that much more successful, we wanna know what that skill you might be looking for is um, on the letter of intent. Uh, so the grant review committee is the same grant review committee that reviewed uh, the GOS and project grants for this last cycle and so they um, have recommitted to following through. This is novel for them too. They're usually uh, done in June and they're like, wow, thank God that's over. And then hope, and then uh, they may or may not volunteer uh, for the next cycle, uh, but all of them with the exception of one have agreed to return uh, to help with this grant uh, cycle because they believe in, they believe in it. Uh, okay, so projects, must include at least one project partner. This is new. We've never, as that I'm aware of, have required you to have partnerships. In some ways, um, partnerships have always been kind of in, in view of the GOS or project programs because, you know, the reviewers ask themselves, would a partner be benefited? Would this project be benefited by a partner and they didn't identify a partner? Um, or are they presenting partners that are ultimately strengthening the project um, but it wasn't a requirement. Now we're actually requiring that because we want to see through this grant program that more than one organization is, is enhanced or more than, or a, a sort of, a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, a cross section of the sector um, is enhanced uh, or the, that, that cross section of the sector is able to do more for the community um, through the pandemic or, or as, as, a, as a process of recovering from the pandemic. Uh, so partnerships or collaborations demonstrate that there is interest in this project, in, in whatever the proposed project is, rather than just a single organization coming forward and saying, we think this is a good idea. Um, that said, on the letters of intent, we're not requiring that um, projects need to identify um, secured or like committed partners. It could be like, we're talking, we're, we, we, we've begun to share ideas and we, we both believe this is interesting. Uh, but at the letter of intent phase, you don't have to say, so-and-so is committing X, Y, Z, um, is gonna do this amount of lift uh, and they're bound to that. Letter of intent really is just, what do you think? Are we headed in the right direction? 
So successful projects uh, can include art making as well as practical capacity building initiatives. Um, so, um, and, and I don't have any real good examples uh, to share with you about what the distinction might be, uh, but um, a massive collaboration, and it doesn't have to be massive, but like a collaboration of multiple artists and multiple organizations that are doing something to build awareness for a given sector, I think could qualify for this project, or it could be a specific capacity building initiative that, um, that helps that section of people um, do something either independently or together. Um, and then with all of our projects, we do require that it somehow serves the arts, culture or cultural equity, um, and uh, the production or presentation or teaching of science programming to the public. Um, so that has to be a part of whatever project that is presented. So this, these are just ideas to start with, and they're not specific ideas in terms of like projects that you could do, but we're starting to think, but when you want to think kind of systemically, uh, what is going to result in change or support and, or what are the things that we're trying to change? So arts workforce, for example, um, many artists in town are out of work either because their art form is not um, able to be monetized um, or uh, they are out of work because their secondary jobs or their other jobs are service related jobs or, or, or they've been you know, cut because of, of the recession or pandemic. Um, so arts workforce can be addressed in a couple of different ways, right? Um, you can't find work outside of art or your work, art work itself is not as lucrative or um, uh, sustainable as it was before because of the pandemic. So is there a solution that supports the artists themselves? Um, so technology, and all of these, I think, are going to ultimately go back to arts workforce at the end. So a vibrant creative sector is going to support artists in general. Um, technology. So can we connect COVID isolated individuals to cultural programming? And that's with the understanding that um, it's going to take some time for, uh, for the sector to recover and for confidence to recover. Um, and when we're thinking about things from through an equity lens, um, one of the things that um, the pandemic has taught us is that um, things like Zoom connect us, even though we may not like uh, the experience, um, but they may provide opportunity and experiences to people that otherwise may not have that opportunity. So can technology solve that? And can technology perpetuate that kind of accessibility or innovation um, even when the pandemic is no longer impacting us. Um, in, in equipment, uh, so are there shared things that we could use that support physical distancing or that uh, make it easier as uh, facilities uh, reopen or performing groups or what have you start um, coming together again that can um, facilitate safe uh, attendance. Uh, marketplace. Um, so are there new opportunities uh, for artists uh, or creative professionals to sell their work? Um, or is there, are there ways that we can help retailers adapt? Again, this could be something that is specifically addressing the pandemic, but could have side benefits down the road. Um, so if something is said, you know, we wanted to create a website that did X um, and supported artists, that that would um, be important now but maybe have long-term benefit for, for Flagstaff creative sector uh, because that, that is a, a, a useful platform even without the pandemic. Um, so economic uncertainty, uh, that is obviously the sector itself has economic uncertainty, uh, but is there, um, are we gonna, as we reemerge from the pandemic, are people gonna be less able to pay uh, to participate or to um, access or um, be patrons of the arts. And um, so that accessibility question could address um, that, like the, the loss of revenue or like, hey, we still, we, we know that there's a group of people that usually participate in our programs, but can't, how are we gonna help them keep in touch um, and as well as um, supporting kind of the, the, the economic change that's associated uh, with, with that uncertainty. 
Uh, so those are just kind of ways that we can think about systems and uh, there's not an exhaustive list. And so I'm happy to talk about um, other examples, uh, but those were kind of the initial examples that kind of helped us think through that this may be a worthwhile program uh, to put money behind. Any questions about the focus areas? Example focus areas, I guess. Okay, I'll move along. So who can apply? Um, for the letter of intent, we're a little looser than maybe we are with our regular uh, grant application. And so what we're saying is all collaborative groups that have an idea that addresses a need or opportunity presented by the pandemic uh, and economic recession are encouraged to complete a letter of intent, whether or not a lead nonprofit partner has been identified. So I know we have some for-profit for in, um, related individuals or just um, um, independent individuals that are participating um, on this call. Um, we want to hear good ideas. And then, you know, through the letter of intent review process, um, you know, we will, um, you know, try and understand a pathway to help good ideas succeed. Um, and so that's with some understanding that there may be limitations on the funding as, as a result of the source of the funding. So ultimately, the checks from this program have to go to a nonprofit organization. Um, but we can help uh, figure out how to get to that, um, that compliance. Uh, that said, if a project is kind of teetering on the edge, is really a stretch for this grant program, we still want to hear the idea because if it really is going to have demonstra demonstrable impact for the community, it's something we want to know about so that we can start thinking about and figuring out if there are other ways to support it. And if, even if that means trying to play matchmaker and to help, help um, those ideas find the right resources. So even if we don't have the resources or are, are unable to support a project directly, we want to see good ideas succeed. Does that make sense? Um, so funds can be used for just about anything. Uh, there really are no restrictions on the specific line items that the funds can pay for, except capital. Um, so you can't buy a building with this. Um, uh, uh, and you're not going to on $10,000 anyway, so you're gonna have a hard time making, making the case for something like that. Um, but we are open to other capitalized expenses, so uh, such as equipment or what, what have you, as long as it's able to demonstrate uh, the, the impact that we're looking for. Um, so it, like I said, if you are inv invited to submit a final application, you must have an active nonprofit uh, partner or sponsor. Um, that is a 501c3 uh, based in Arizona. So uh, Yeah, so if the school, sorry, this, the dance group this, um, on this call, um, you would need to find a local um, partner uh, to support uh, this project. But it's not necessarily, doesn't have to be um, in writing and um, completed uh, prior to submitting a letter of intent. Uh, so how to apply uh, submittable is a pretty straightforward platform. Uh, most of you have gone through this in the last um, six months with us. Uh, and we've gotten really positive feedback on that platform in terms of how much easier it is to um, navigate and understand. Um, we've obviously also identified opportunities for improvement with the platform. Uh, so hopefully this time around, we'll be able to um, make it even easier uh, to understand. Um, we will use the submittable platform for all communications after something is submitted. Uh, and I know that uh, some people the last time around had um, some issues with that going into their spam or what have you. Once you submit an application, make sure that um, the submittable platform, uh, any emails coming from that uh, aren't going to your uh, spam filter. That way we have sort of a complete life cycle record of the application and any uh, coordination and, and, and response uh, associated with that in one place. 
Um, so the, through the letter of intent process, uh, so we're looking for a broad set of ideas and partnership collaborations. Um, it can just be in the formative stage. However, um, if you are invited to apply, you're going to have a fairly quick turn uh, to get a full application in. So even though you may submit an idea in the formative stage on the due date for this, um, you should still be working with the people that you think you might want to work with uh, to continue to refine uh, that relationship uh, with them. Uh, because once we send the questions back and, and we give you the green light to apply, if you're invited to apply, uh, you're going to have to button up all those details uh, pretty quickly. And I'll show the timeline of that in a little bit. Um, so we're looking for a snapshot uh, and how it addresses the common needs or opportunities presented by the pandemic. Um, you will also state your funding request amount, but it, we're not looking for a detailed budget. So really what you're saying is, uh, we're asking for $10,000. We think the project might cost 15 or it might only cost 10. The reason we don't have a cash, ma cash match or, or other funding sources is this, but you can be super loose with that, um, but just provide some justification for the amount that you're looking for. Um, and like I said, you don't have to have a commitment on the um, fiscal agent at the time of the letter of intent. Uh, but if you do know, who would it be? Or if you are a 501c3, that's beneficial to know that. Uh, so the project idea will be shared in the letter of intent. Um, you'll be asked, how does the project support the recovery of Flagstaff's creative sector, or does it address a long-term opportunity presented by the pandemic? Um, do you represent a nonprofit that will be the primary applicant? Um, and why are you, the organization and the group you represent, interested in pursuing the project? And so uh, we want to understand, um, you know, that are you just a cheerleader, uh, whatever it is, and you want to step in and help? Or are you, um, you know, a respected organization that is able to pull together um, all those peers? And not that the cheerleader can't do that um, as well, but just kind of help us understand why you're interested in it, because part of the success of these projects is going to be um, the passion and drive uh, behind them. And uh, and, and with and an understanding that the people involved are going to be able to get it done. Uh, so we're looking for what partnerships or collaborations are needed for the project to be successful. And if those partnerships are not already secured, how do you intend to secure them by the application deadline? Um, and then the cost I mentioned, um, and what kinds of expenses do you anticipate? Uh, and how do you anticipate securing additional resources if they're needed? Um, so then what kind of technical support, if any, can we provide to help? Um, and if this is an ongoing project, how do you imagine sustaining it? Uh, so if it's an equipment purchase, how is that equipment going to be maintained and supported in the future? Um, if it's a service that's being provided, how is that going to be maintained or supported in the future? It's possible that this project can also be funded through our other grant programs in the future. Um, but please don't apply counting on something like that being able to happen. Um, okay, so after the letter of intent is submitted, uh, we may reach out for clarification. Um, however, the deadline is uh, the day before the committee meets. It just so happened that is when the committee can meet in that week. So if you submit your letter of intent sooner, we're able to respond and ask questions. The more opportunity we have to seek clarification, the better. If you submit it on the night before the committee meets, uh, we may have questions ultimately, but we may not be able to get those answers. Again, in this process, because um, it is focused on recovery, it's focused on the Arts Council being a, available for technical support as well, we are going to be more communicative and, 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 and asking questions in a way that we haven't done before. Because in our previous and our other grant programs, we have interviews and we have all of that. We're not going to have that opportunity this time. So staff is going to be supporting the committee by seeking clarification when clarification is needed. Um, the, so staff will inform uh, the committee on whether it's able to provide any of the technical support that's mentioned. So if you say, we want grant writing support. Um, we, staff is going to review that 
and based upon the letter of intent, just provide an assessment to the committee as to whether or not we can fulfill that in the way that it's being asked. And if you ask that in the letter of intent, we may call you before the committee meeting and just to clarify exactly what it is that you need if, it's, if, it, if it needs more clarity. Um, but we will make that advisement to um, the committee. Um, so the letter of intent will be evaluated in the following criteria. So um, if there's any technical support requested, our capacity to provide that, the clarity of the idea, um, does it address a defined need or opportunity? Uh, the requested award amount is reasonable in alliance with the project's goals and the project is uh, feasible and the submitter has the ability to convene the proposed partnerships. So mostly just being like, will this float, right? Um, is, this, is this a reasonable idea? Um, does it have impact? And um, if funded, is something that's going to be able to happen? Okay, and we may also, so when we do invitations, we may provide additional questions that will be amended or appended to the full grant application. So that's unique as well because we don't have the interview process. We may send out three questions saying, congratulations, you're, you're invited to apply. Please full, fill out the full application at this link and answer these three additional questions. So that is something that we may pursue. So the overall evaluation criteria, so the economic impact and resiliency. So does the project enhance the opportunity for part of the creative sector to adapt or su succeed through the pandemic? Uh, does the project present or preserve economic opportunity within or adjacent to the creative sector? And does the project have the potential for lasting impact or support ongoing resiliency to the sector after the pandemic or recession passes? And the next criteria point is collaborations, partnerships, and opportunities for success. Um, is it being presented by appropriate stakeholders? Are there multiple project partners? Um, is there skill to implement? Um, do the partnerships enhance the project? Is there clear evidence for support? Um, are there other identified funders? Um, if not, is there a plan? Uh, does the project leadership have a track record um, of executing similar project and uh, does the project have a clear and achievable plan and timeline. So opportunity for success, um, who's involved and are they the right people involved. Um, alignment, uh, so does it address the opportunity or need identified? Um, would this project happen without grant support or would the impact of the project be greatly diminished without grant support? Um, so this is really alignment is a is kind of code for need. Um, and uh, is this the best time to do it? So hopefully because all these projects are going to be related to the pandemic, yes, it's probably going to be the best time to do whatever the project is. Um, but again, in your uh, writing, can you clarify need time and this is the appropriate time to do it? Uh, and then are we able to support the project um, as, as requested? So public benefits requirements of tax funded um, grant programs. So are we enhancing the quality of life in Flagstaff? Um, is, is it addressing needs of the community and is the work um, in the application unique and important to the sector? And does it enhance cultural equity and preservation? So it doesn't have to do all those things, but still the project has to benefit the citizens of Flagstaff ultimately. Any questions about what I've gone over so far? Wow, okay. So the schedule, um, the funding period will be December 1st to November 30th. Um, the application, the letter of intent, we're calling a letter of intent really is, in other words, it's just a short application. Um, I think we intended it to be a letter up front and then we structured it through questions. So it's kind of a short application, it's not really a letter. Um, you can write dear, dear committee at the top if you want to. Um, the, information sessions which you're participating in now and then the deadline to apply is in just uh, 20 days uh, for that letter of intent again that doesn't have to be fully fleshed out it just needs you just need to demonstrate interest and um, and and impact 
so the committee will meet on Monday, September 21st. Uh, we will um, publish that link uh, for that meeting if you want to sit and listen. However, we won't be accepting comments at that time. Uh, so again, another reason to kind of get in your application sooner so that staff has the opportunity to have a dialogue prior to uh, the committee meeting. And then we'll do a quick turn on that. Uh, and, and by Friday of that week, we will uh, send out the invitations to um, projects that are invited to apply. Um, so then ultimately the deadline for that application is gonna be um, a little less than four weeks later uh, on Sunday, October 18th. Uh, so three to four weeks uh, to turn a full application um, the full application is not going to be as onerous as um, our full GOS applications, um, but it will require more detail than the letter of intent. Fortunately, the letter of intent is kind of like a practice application. You already have some of the content and ideas thought out that go into the full application. And so the Art and Science Committee will meet in the week following those submissions, and then they will, again, quick turn uh, to submit those recommendations to the board, which will review and approve uh, the allocations on Wednesday, October 28th, which gives us the opportunity to then um, pull together uh, notifications of award uh, by Friday. So again, another quick turn uh, to then start contracting and um, you know dialing in all the kind of legal details associated with the grant award uh, to be able to release funds on December 1st. So, and we already have the funds in the bank. Um, and it's not like uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year where we're waiting for the money to show up that we can then turn around and write checks to everyone. Um, we won't, there won't be really a waiting period um, after uh, the uh, contracts are signed. And in theory, we could technically turn the funds immediately after a contract is signed, um, but for, for sake of, of, of um, simplicity, we're saying December 1st is the performance period. So who wants to start a project right before Thanksgiving anyways? Um, so that is the restrictions. We have lifted some of the restrictions on uh, this program. And uh, I'm looking at, sorry, Chris, I think this may be. That's copied from your previous presentation, so I'm not sure what. It's incorrect. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the grant guidelines uh, that are available on the website, and this is for our regular grant programs, the restrictions, uh, we did um, uh, restrict, lift the restriction on things like um, uh, fiscal agent fees, as well as uh, K to 12. Uh, programs focusing on K to 12 participants. Um, and there's a couple other things that we kind of removed uh, from the restrictions because we want, we're open to, to enhancing sort of all aspects of the creative sector and helping that come out uh, uh, for, for those things to improve and, and grow over the next year to two years. Um, so that's it. Are there any questions? And I can't believe we would go through an entire grant presentation of a novel grant program without a question. Paul. Oh, yeah, I'm on. Uh, regarding this selection process, um, is there a thought or, or do you have an idea of whether the letter of intent, the process of going through the letters of intent would narrow it down to the maximum eight? recipients and that the final application is just determining the you know the final approvals or would there be more than eight possibly selected during the letter of intent and then expect the letter of intent. Down from there I expect the letter of intent will be more um, and I, I guess I should say also that um, I don't think we're necessarily restricting Letters, letters of intent to one, right? So if a group of people have more than one good idea, um, you know, we welcome more than one good idea. Um, we would probably only fund one of an idea from a similar group. Um, but 
the because uh, the ideas are probably still in the formative stages, I would imagine we would invite more than the eight uh, to apply. Um, but it's, it's hard to say, you know, because what 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 could happen is uh, if you invited eight to apply, and then ultimately um, that had a total of forty thousand dollars in asks, and we ultimately only decided to to fund six of them. You know, would we allocate additional funds to projects we thought could use more of it, or um, the committee? I mean, it's to weed out ideas that maybe aren't close to the mark, right? And then the final application process will refine it down. Um, but I don't anticipate us being like we received twenty proposals in the letter of intent phase, and then we only cut it down you know, to 18 or something. I imagine we'd cut it down more, but I, I can't really speak for the committee. Um, it's their, their evaluation at the letter of intent stage is like, is this an idea worth continuing to consider funding um, or is it one that we don't think will be viable? And we say we, I'm not on the selection panel. Um, ultimately that decision is made by that committee. Did that answer your question? It's hard to answer that specifically. Yes, thank you. That was that was helpful. Thanks. I, I see. I think there's a question in the chat. If you yeah, I, I got it. Thank you, Paul. Um, so Jonathan Sarah, Saza Kent is asking. They're already a nonprofit organization, and she's just confirming that they would still need to find another partner, whether they're nonprofit or another other they can't just do it solely alone i had to look into that so we copied and pasted um that language from other grant programs so um saza if you want to uh shoot us a, a few sentence email uh with your question um like in terms of like what you're who you were intending to potentially partner with in flagstaff so again partnerships are required um that we may be able to help evaluate uh, whether or not that requirement is um, fast and true or if it's just kind of a legacy requirement. Um, but typically I would think that the committee may prefer um, uh, at least a strong local partner associated with um, what you, whatever it is that you're thinking. Um, she was just thinking about a partnering with a school district or another community organization. So I think you covered that. And Paul, I just wanted to pipe in really quick. I want to be clear right now, this is our first go about using this letter of an in intent survey or like process. And your goal is to spark that fire. You want to like ignite them with this idea. And it's giving you an opportunity to do that without having to a whole application out with the potential of not being funded or not clearly understood. It's really opening up that communication platform that we've not been able to do before. So when you're doing this letter of intent, think about that. Think about how can I spark their imagination? How can I get them excited about this project? This is where you can tap into that passion that we've always kind of, you know, kind of curved into quantifiable data. So use that letter of intent to your advantage. Yeah, and I would add to that, Chris, um, we did not set any character limits on the application. And um, I think that's what the understanding that you're going to be brief and you're going to put the energy where you think the energy needs to be put. But please imagine it as a letter. Um, and um, we don't want four page letters. Um, one to two page letters in theory is what we're going for here. Um, if that makes sense. So everyone's kind of self-policing on the length of their responses in each section, but um, please try and keep uh, the total content length to what you might imagine would be one or two pages. Eric, Sarah, Chris, Katie, anybody have questions? Anybody want to share the idea that they were that inspired them to uh, come to this work session? 
Hi, well, this is Katie. Um, you know, I didn't really have an idea coming into it, but now that I've, I've listened and I've, I've looked at your points, I can see a number of ideas that have come to mind. In particular, we've never been a great group that has um, done a lot of programs virtually, so it's always stuck very much so with our local community. And this year we're offering our Highland Tea with Diana Gabaldon virtually, and the reception that we've gotten from that has been fantastic. And it's something that we would probably continue in the future. So I could see using a fund like this to help purchase Zoom webinar accounts, which are very expensive in order to host events in the future. So, so. And, and just encourage you, if you're thinking of something along those lines, like how that um, other people have access to that beyond a single organization. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah, so, you know, it definitely sparked a lot of ideas just listening to this. So thank you. So uh, Susan asked how for-profit businesses uh, could benefit from this. So in my mind, when I was writing this, these guidelines, I was thinking about kind of the different sectors or different sub parts of our sector. Um, one example would be like uh, galleries, right? We have a mix of for-profit and nonprofit galleries in town, um, none of whom really have, uh, in my mind, um, fairly sophisticated sophisticated um, online presences is there something that could be created that support them through the digital physical divide um, was just kind of one idea that popped into my head um, and then another one that came to mind for me um, say in in your case for performing um, arts venues the performance venues um, you know uh, if there is shared equipment opportunities. Um, you know, I know that you guys have invested in your um, live streaming capabilities. Are there ways that that could then be partnered uh, with other nonprofit organizations and even other for-profit organizations to kind of help them have access to that? Um, depending on the idea, we'll have to talk offline about how that is um, the, the path to compliance, essentially for the, being the nonprofit applicant, um, would need to be on, in, in charge. But the the point is, is that if you as a venue identify an opportunity that would help your venue succeed through the pandemic, if you can say, wait a minute, several other venues have that similar need or opportunity, um, that and if we could you know reduce expense or um increase collaboration or whatever it is by doing the thing together right then that is something that we want want to hear about um but that could be it doesn't have to be a combination of for-profit and non-profit necessarily it could be we are um or it could be music producers right so um uh how you know whether they're for profit or non profit but let's just say there was a series of for profit venues in town that all saw this opportunity so that when the pandemic started to come uh the restrictions were started to lift it would help you be more ready uh to uh, receive customers again i think we're open to that idea um the question mark is how do we make sure we maintain compliance and part of what we said in the grant guidelines is it serves a nonprofit purpose and what we mean by that is is there is it is it a is it a novel thing of which there is not a nonprofit organization already doing but you could believe that a nonprofit organization might do it um and so uh, it could be, you know, the Nonprofit Venue Association of Flagstaff, theoretical, um, Nonprofit Venue Association wants to do something in support of the venues in town. But that organization doesn't exist. But if you can make, make the case that this is a normal thing that a nonprofit might do, then we'll kind of work with you to figure out how to, um, to you know, check the right boxes to help that be successful. I suspect, however, that most ideas, um, at least in the venue space, are going to have some version of nonprofit collab potential collaborators. So nonprofit venues, 
nonprofit um, uh, promoters, uh, nonprofit. Um, sorry, I'm losing my, my train of thought. But so that maybe you're at lower risk of, of not having to create a fictitious nonprofit um, in your head uh, to write the application. Um, does that answer your question, Susan? Um, yeah, you know, I've had a hard time hearing you. Sorry, my internet might be spotty. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, we were just trying to see as I've had some nonprofits come to me to be incorporated in this. It's tough when we can't be what it sounds like as a leader in this, as not being the one, you know, who can. I've got lots of opportunities and ways to support people. This wouldn't be specifically to help you or if you in recover because it's such a long road ahead for us. But I was just curious if not being a nonprofit, could I be a lead on this grant application or would that have to come from a nonprofit? So I can talk to you a little bit more about yeah, offline. Would, but yes, you know, we're looking for leadership wherever that comes from. And, um, so I think that, you know, that that's part of that evaluating the capacity of the project to succeed. Um, and, you know, if another venue or a similarly related nonprofit was willing to be kind of the, the paper applicant, right, but the project team included the Orpheum as sort of a leader on the project team, I think that's certainly viable. Okay, thanks a lot. Jonathan, right now the um, Flagstaff Community Band, Master Chorale, and Orchestra Northern Arizona are all looking to do a joint, um, you know, collaborative um, online concert, virtual concert in December. We're used to all providing big concerts for audiences around the holidays and obviously can't do that in the same way this year. So we thought that if we did them if we did something all together with some things taped ahead of time and a couple of things live um, based in the Orpheum um, and that would not only give our members something to do give our audiences something to do but also help build our audiences because it would be bringing these three groups together and the audience bases from each of them would see other groups um, and then hopefully, you know, in the future when we can be back to in person, go and seek out these other groups. And the community band, it's one that we do every year, also is a um, food drive for the Flagstaff Family Food Center in town. And so we would also want to collaborate with them and still do some sort of a virtual food drive through it. So it would be Flagstaff Community Band, Orpheum, Master Chorale, um, or Orchestra Northern Arizona and the food bank all together. Um, so this, is this clarifying the idea that Susan was alluding to or is this in addition to? Well, I've, she probably, uh, she's been in on um, a meeting with us about this. So that's why I think she probably has some other stuff also, but would that be one way that she can be involved with the Orpheum with that? I mean, certainly I think she can be involved with that. Um, you know, the, I'll be curious to see how um, the presentation of art works out um, in terms of this program um, and what we'd be looking for in the letter of intent is um, that this concert uh, performance idea has some kind of important um, catalytic impact um, and, and, and it could be enough that this is a, a collaboration that's going to have a fair amount of visibility um, where all of these groups collectively or independently could not get this vis visibility um, for the last nine months um, and it'll help them slingshot beyond. Um, I think that there's a case for that in terms of having um, collaborative uh, and you know some kind of outcome uh, that, that is impactful. Um, so I think there's a case, uh, but it's it's certainly not like we're, we're learning this skill. The skill is going to help us do something uh, differently in the future, or maybe you can make that case as well. Um, but yeah, we're looking for, um, and it, it, maybe that enhances it. You know, I can't really speak for the committee, 
and based on what all that's going to be in front of them. But the um, the concert itself has um, marketing impact. The the fact of doing it uh, in in the in the format you're describing and and maybe the new collaborations will result in um, sort of longer term enhancement. Those are things that we'll be looking to understand. Jonathan, I, I have a question for you regarding Jody's um, her project idea. And I guess I want to be clear for myself as well. If these other organizations were already funded for general operating support and they would still do that said event even without this collaboration, you know, grant, like how, where do we stop the overlap of already funded GOS? Maybe they changed it to virtual instead of in person, but it still was funded under GOS. I'm not quite sure. And I think maybe that might be a conversation for later, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Is it new and above and beyond the GOS? For all three of these groups, um, the all three of the performing groups, this would be something different than what we already had planned. Yeah, I mean, I think we would, um, after the letter of intent, you know, try and evaluate, um, you know, we certainly can't have city dollars matching city dollars, um, you know, could just like you can't have federal dollars matching federal dollars. Um, so I think there's low risk uh, in terms of the of running into any matching issues, um, but it should be novel, right? So it has, it has to seem like we're doing something to, together um, to, to have a, a specific uh, pandemic out related outcome. Uh, and if it is taking existing stuff and mashing it up in new ways, and then down the road, because of that mashup, we've now learned something together that is um, transformative, I think that that's okay. Um, but ultimately it is up to the committee um, based upon the projects that are presented to them. Chris, do you have any questions or? Eric or Sarah? I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I think you, I'm gonna start my video. Um, this is Eric. Um, yeah, I think you covered a lot of it. Um, I guess the kind of thing that I'm kind of mauling over is um, I don't think my project would meet that like $5,000 mark. I think it would be a little bit lower uh, than that one. Um, is there, if you had, I guess, more smaller projects, would you consider more uh, more than the eight folks? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I just, um, what we're, we're trying to do is, is to be efficient with our resources. Uh, but if we had a series of tens and a series of threes, that's okay too. Uh, but we just, um, you know, wanted to know if people were thinking in that direction um, so we can just anticipate what's going on. Um, but, you know, uh, I appreciate your frugality as well um, with being able to accomplish whatever project it is for 3000 um, But one of the things I would ask yourself is would 5000 make it better um, and have yeah. more impact? Um, you know, so keep that in mind. And maybe in your a letter of intent, when you talk about budget, you can say, you know, I really only think we need three, but if we got five, we could do this um, or something like that. Okay. Yeah, and there's probably, um, I, I think the, the big cost, upfront cost is my equipment and I actually have already purchased that um, as far as my, my camera equipment, um, just recently actually. Um, so there, there probably isn't a way of retroactively going back, especially as an indiv indiv individual. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't um, pay for past expenses. Um, ha any costs would need to be incurred after December 1st. Very, very uh, understandable. <laughs> Well, I hope um, 
you know, this is an intriguing opportunity. Um, and the idea of, of working together um, with or without grant support um, is impactful. Uh, that if hopefully the wheels are turning in terms of how we can um, work together uh, through this and, and that hopefully the money that is behind this grant program will um, add even more fuel to um, this. And I know there were some other people that were interested in the grant program that aren't here tonight. So we're going to post this uh, recording to um, the uh, website and we're going to share it out on our social media so that people can see that and, and then re they'll be able to reach out to us and ask questions as well. And, and along those lines, uh, we're very available to answer questions uh, for this program as you guys are thinking through potential applications. Okay, all right, well, uh, we don't need the full time. Uh, we might as well break early. Uh, and you guys have a good day and just let me know um, if there's anything else that we can do.